It's Tuesday. Yay. You know what that means. I'm Alex. And I'm Amber. And this is another episode of True Crime and Chill. You know that we do our best to cover cases that aren't always really well known. Mm -hmm. However, we also understand that sometimes people might just be learning about a high profile case. And sometimes we get to be part of that deep dive. Oh, yeah. It's my favorite part. So this week, we're discussing a well-known case that maybe you know about, but don't know all the information about. Yeah. And this one has a lot of information. So we're pretty much just going to jump right in. Let's do it. On August 9th, 1969, the headlines across the country mourned the loss of 26-year-old and eight and a half months pregnant actress Sharon Tate and four others at her estate at 10050 Cielo Drive in Beverly Hills, Jay Sebring, Wojtek Frayowski, Abigail Folger, and Stephen Parent. Dominic Dunn recalls that, and I quote, the shockwaves that went through the town were beyond anything I had ever seen before. People were convinced that the rich and famous of the community were in peril. Children were sent out of town and guards were hired, end quote. This was only a tiny piece of the helter-skelter plan that Charles Manson had formed based on the race war he believed was coming. Recently, I stumbled across some videos about the event, and it sent me down a deep rabbit hole about the events that happened before and after, leaving confusion and sadness in the wake of it all. So, Chillers, today we bring you the heinous helter-skelter case. So, just a side note, most of the information that we are sharing with you today is based on testimonies of eyewitnesses like Linda, Linda Kasabian, a Manson family member, Catherine Scher, Chief Prosecutor Vincent Bogliosi, and court records. Mm, yes. So let's chat really quick about 1969. This is very much the height of the 60s culture. People were discovering themselves and beginning to break free of the bureaucratic expectations. We're talking flower children, hippies, free love, sex, drugs, rock and roll. This is the year of the Beatles' last public performance, the moon landing, and Woodstock. So Charles Manson is often seen as many things. But once upon a time, he was a charismatic musician who had a following of his own. His followers, and I won't call them friends, but the people he knew called him Charlie. And he had essentially a commune down in Benedict Canyon, California, that was once a Western movie set. It was called Spawn Ranch, and it was a place where people were coming to get away from the expectations of society and just be loving and free. So essentially just trying to be hippies. Yeah, you um, know, now, Summer the ranch of Love. Was, it, it, right. Well, the Summer of Love was actually 1967. But that's a whole other, it's... Well, yeah. let, anyway. let, let's let's be real. It just kind of carried over with what they're doing right now. Right. Well, and just a, totally a side note here, but in reality, when people refer to like an era, it's usually the, la the latter half of that year and the first few years from the year before. So like the 1950s was actually more like 1956 to 1962, right? And so an era is usually like the last half. So when we talk about like the 60s, this is deep in the 60s, right? Like the 70s were more like the later 70s, early 80s. The 80s were the late 80s, early 90s. So when we talk about the 60s and it's 1969, we're talking like the 60s. Bell bottoms, daisies, free love. Ironically, all of those fashions are starting to come back along with the 90s. History repeats itself, which is why it's so important to study history, whether it be fashion or true crime or, or, you know, world wars, the world wars. The ranch was owned by a man named George Spawn, and it was the kind of place where they would like party every night and spend their days basically recovering. Uh, people felt cared for and they felt safe. Charles Manson had built a little family around himself and newcomers to the ranch felt like there was this excitement that was built up around him and he was described as attractive and charismatic and they all felt like they were, and I quote, his children. Now, just a little background here. Charles Manson was born in Cincinnati in November of 1934 and he started committing crimes as early as 12 years old. By 32, 
1967, he had spent 17 years in reformatories and prisons. And as we said before, 1967 was referred to as the Summer of Love. And that year, Manson picked up his guitar and made the trek, as all good hippies do, to San Francisco. And he gained a following, and then he called them his family. And this family included Patricia Krenwinkel from Los Angeles, who at one time thought she wanted to be a nun, uh, Leslie Van Houten, a former homecoming princess from San Gabriel Valley, Tex Watson, who came from, surprise, Texas, and he had been an honor roll student and star athlete in multiple sports, and then Susan Atkins, who was also from California and at one point was a topless dancer, and Bobby Boussoulet was also a musician. So It really just goes to show that a lot of, like, cult members they really come from all different backgrounds like when people talk about cults and stuff like that it's like oh it's all people who might be like weak-minded and stuff like that and it's like no you have like honor roll students and homecoming queens and stuff it's not always the weird kid sitting in the corner doodling in his notebook like yeah no it's not like that at all in fact uh, one of the articles I think I have referenced on our website, truecrimeandchill.com, I was trying to find connections between like Jonestown and this because they're only like nine years apart, right? Yeah. And um, there were, it, like, he talked about how he was talking with people who had been part of People's Temple and like People's Temple had really helped them and they were like intelligent people, um, but they also weren't necessarily the people that defected to to Jonestown. So, yeah. Um, but you're right. It's, it, it literally can be anybody. It's usually people who are just seeking acceptance of some kind so for example tex watson who was an honor roll student and like a sports athlete right why do you think he did those things it's because he wanted to be loved and accepted and so he found a group in california that did that yep so uh linda kasabian was the newest person to the commune and she had proven her worth by stealing five thousand dollars from her soon-to-be ex-husband and his friend and she brought it back to the commune and this literally bought her a level of trust from the other members of the commune including charles manson and in the summer of 1969 spawn ranch had 32 adults and seven children living there see it's it's hilarious because you always think about like oh all these people they're all adults a lot of people don't know that there were kids there Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. there were just people brought their children including lindy kasabian she brought her daughter with her yeah so now manson in his own right had become a leader in this compound as people loved the music that he wrote and played and he was charming former members of the family recall his talent when it came to music Linda recalls the days at the ranch, and they involved Charlie playing music, telling stories, dancing around, and just being free. Everybody was like one, you know? There was a harmony amongst all of us, and it was actually beautiful. And that's a direct quote from uh, Linda Kasabian. Yeah, so, it's so beautiful. Well, I mean, when you're in that place, I mean, when you're 20, 21, and you're yeah. you know doing a lot of drugs and having this sort of freedom to do whatever, yeah, it, it yeah. could be beautiful. Uh, So speaking of drugs, Manson would often take drug trips with his family. They would go on LSD trips, drop acid, and have orgies. However, he would do this very strategically where he would take no drugs or a much smaller amount than everyone else. He wanted to keep control over his actions. And it also helped him keep control over the family, only allowing people to kiss or touch or have sex when he said it was okay. Now, Prosecuting attorney Vincent Bugliosi believes that during these drug trips, Manson would take the opportunity to dig into the minds of his followers and work to remove their long-standing convictions on life, breaking down their ego and allowing them to be easily controlled. He says, and I quote, he realized very early on that they would do what he wanted them to do if they had no ego. So, end quote. Uh, In doing this, he got his followers to break into people's homes at night, steal their jewelry to help fund their compound, and then just rearrange the furniture because they thought it was funny. Uh, He was so convincing about all of this that he had some of his followers believing he was the second coming of Christ and Lucifer all rolled into one. Yeah, because that's not... That's totally normal way of thinking. Right, well... um... Totally normal! (laughs) Um, The interesting thing is that uh, Catherine Scher, who was also known as Gypsy, 
actually remembers telling people with very much conviction that he was the second coming of Christ. She honestly believed it at the time. That's how convincing he was. Dang. So now the Beatles dropped an album in 1968, which is referred to as the White Album. Uh, and on it was a song called Helter Skelter, which is not an unknown song. A lot of people know this song. Now, for the record, this is also the album referred to as the Beatles' most psychedelic and surreal record. And it also created that rumor that if you play the record backwards, it says Paul is dead and I miss him, miss him, miss him, uh, which kind of gained urgency in a slightly frightening crescendo. And it fueled a widely circulated rumor that Paul McCartney had died and been replaced by someone who looked exactly the same and had the same singing, playing and songwriting talent, you know, because that's normal. So um, it kind of reminds me of like with of like uh, uh, Pink Floyd, I think if you Dark Side of the Moon, if you play that while watching uh, Wizard of Oz, it can like it syncs up, so it kind of reminds me of like those urban legends and stuff, sure. or, like the Avril Lavigne conspiracy and everything. Oh yeah, like, I can't tell you how many like oh this celebrity died and they have a doppelganger. Like like Lady Gaga apparently like killed somebody and took on her mm-hmm. her like life and became famous and like what Avril did I say? Is History dead. repeats itself. Yeah, or like or like uh, Katy Perry is John Benet Ramsey. <laughs> Yeah, I've heard that one too. <laughs> I mean, they look enough alike I can see where people they would do, fill in but those it's gaps, like, but it's like you guys. Right. All right. So the song Helter Skelter, according to Paul McCartney, is about a playground slide. And he's quoted as saying, I was using the symbol of a helter skelter or a playground slide as a ride from the top to the bottom, the rise and fall of the Roman Empire. This was the demise, the going down. You could have thought as a rather cute title. However, Charles Manson heard something entirely different. He believed the Beatles' music, and particularly the song Helter Skelter, contained subliminal messaging to commit violence. And that's like on the same that's like on the same level as violent video games make school shooters. Sorta, yeah. In a lot except for this, he fully believed had subliminal messaging. Like it's sort of a thing like this happened in the 90s too with Marilyn Manson and his music. People are like, oh, there's subliminal messages yep. for violence, and you shouldn't listen to Marilyn Manson. And of course it's not true. But it mm-hmm. wouldn't surprise me honestly if Marilyn Manson had started those rumors because he knew that all publicity is publicity. It's good publicity, it's yeah. Mm-hmm. And it would cause people more people to want to listen to his music and see. So uh Liz Will, I think I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, a former federal prosecutor, legal analyst, and author of the book Hunting Charles Manson says Manson believed, and I quote, the race war would end with L.A. in shambles, and only he, Charles Manson, and his followers, would be, who would be waiting in the desert for the exact right time to appear, would come in and save the city, she says. Now, Manson would be the leader of L.A. after the blacks had risen up, which would be Helter Skelter, and all would be Nirvana. So to break it down, Manson truly believed a big race war was coming, and he believed that the African-American population would rise up. He believed that after years of oppression, it was their karma to win. But this being during the civil rights movement, it wasn't a super far-fetched belief. The Black Panthers were taking a stand and promoting Black power. However, Manson was very much a racist, and he believed that color that people of color were subhuman and didn't think they'd be able to handle their newfound power so he believed that they would have to turn the reins of power back over to white people that had survived the uprising and that would be him and his family he had a plan to hide his family in these caves in the desert that he believed were discussed in the chapter of revelations in the bible but here's the interesting thing let me show you a picture of the family in the caves and you tell me whether or not they'd survive a mass uprising here it's not even a cave. It's like a, and we'll have this photo on our website, truecrimeandchill.com, but it's like, it's it, not it even be a, on our video on, on YouTube as well. Yeah. So, but if you, if you listen on podcasts and you don't watch the YouTube videos, then it'll be on our website, but it's not even like a cave. It's like this overhang of a rock with like a tiny little alcove put into it. And there's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There's like nine people shoved so into this. Like, little- the 32 plus the seven kids. Yeah, so like it doesn't even look like it's not even like a cave. It's like a 
it's like a little overhang you would chill out for the day or something like definitely would not be able to survive any kind of uprising that's happening like so okay armageddon new social order all the things most cults are built on again this is really reminding me of like the jonestown stuff and the armageddon stuff and the new social order stuff that's really reminding me of like the denver airport conspiracy crap that we went over last season and everything but i'm just like what right you i mean you've got it using the bible and the beatles Manson used the those as Beatles, a man. Chaos, and he used these things to build up the further the beliefs that he already had, which is really, it's, it's a normal thing for a lot of people to do, right? Yeah. It's just, he was using it oddly. All right. So let's recap so far. Cause I know there's a lot going on here. Manson had a following that he called his family and they lived in a compound housed on an old Western movie set. He used drug trips to help people overcome their egos so they would follow him more willingly. And he believed a huge race war was coming, which he called Helter Skelter off of the song from the Beatles. All right. Yep. Now, one of the ways that Charles Manson had built up his following, like I said, was his musical talent. The reality was that what Manson wanted more than anything, anything was to be a rock star. And he came very, very close to reaching that dream. Could you so imagine if he did, though? Like, could you, like, it makes me wonder if he did become a rock star, would he have gone crazy and done all this stuff? Or would he have just like. Uh, I, I'm not sure what would have happened because basically when everything fell through, which we're going to get into right now, yep. he sort of reverted back to like his criminal mindset, yeah. right? The, oh, knowing yeah. the way that he knew to do what he wanted to do. So I don't know. I think he would have had the money in existence and he wouldn't have to. But, you know, the racism is still there. And what would have happened when the race war didn't happen? Yeah, that's very true. So it's hard to say. Um, now, Manson became friends with Dennis Wilson of the Beach Boys. Now, if you don't uh, if you don't know who the Beach Boys are, I'm sorry, we can't be friends. Okay? Yeah, if you don't know who the Beach Boys are, then just stop watching this right. podcast. This girl has been to Beach Boys concerts. My dad used to take me in the summer all the time. Uh, one time I went and John Stamos was standing in as the drummer, which was amazing because, uh, you know, full house. So yeah. um, with this, the, the Beach Boys had two brothers, Dennis and Brian Wilson. And Dennis mm -hmm. Wilson uh, was friends with Manson. In the spring of 1968, Dennis Wilson picked up two girls hitchhiking and brought them back to his home in the Pacific Palisades. And the two girls were part of the Manson family. So Manson arrived to pick them up and Dennis and Manson hit it off. It said that Dennis was charmed by the hippie lifestyle and Manson's socially conscious lyrics appealed to him. He was such a fan of Manson and his music that he invited the singer to perform at private parties where a lot of famous people were at, uh, including music producers Greg Jackson, as well as Tel Terry Melcher. Um, they had met Manson while attending one of Dennis's parties. Now, he seemed to be enthralled with Manson's musical talent, but many of his guests weren't as impressed. So it got to where Manson and his family were basically living at Dennis Wilson's home. And this was before they had the, the compound. So yeah. Um, now the Wilson brothers, Brian and Dennis had formed their own record label brother records just the year before. So they were looking to start including new talent in their recording lineup by the time that Manson had befriended Dennis. Dennis attempted to record Charles Manson and his family several times at his brother's studio because he was just fascinated with Manson's mind and musical sound. However, there is uh, a tape uh, in the docuseries Helter Skelter, an American myth, where Stephen Desper can be heard saying Charlie was not going to be produced. He had no idea what recording sessions were about or how to make records. He took it all very personally, and he was not a professional artist. Now, Dennis's good friend, Terry Melcher, was a star producer at the time and Doris Day's son. And Manson was hopeful that Terry could secure him a recording contract. However, Terry came out one time in 1969 to listen to the family. He went all the way out to the, the compound and listened. And after listening, Manson drove Terry home to his house located at 10050 Cielo Drive, where he lived with his girlfriend, Candace Bergen. Now, uh, do you know who Candace Bergen is? Yes, I know who Candace Bergen is. Yeah. 
Uh, for those who may not know her by name, she was on a very popular show called Murphy Brown. She was also like the the mother running. Um, if you watch uh, Miss Congeniality, she's the bad guy in Miss Congeniality. That's where I know her from is Miss Congeniality. Spoiler alert. <laughs> she's the bad guy. Um, she was a really well-known actress back in the day. Um, now, Terry later told the LAPD that he was referred to him as a possible music talent. And this is what Bill Kassar recalls. He said, but once he got to the ranch, he just wanted to get the hell out of there. It was filthy and very obvious that there was no talent. Yeah, I don't blame him. It said that being a Hollywood producer, he told Manson, oh, he was very interested and he'd give him a call. Yeah, that's a typical Hollywood brush off. But at the same time, I, if I was getting bad vibes from this dude, like, I wouldn't just brush him off because why would you think he would just leave it alone after that? Right. Exactly. But it's it's typical Hollywood. Honestly, uh, I have a, a friend who refers to it as bring him in the limo and send him in the taxi. So, however, Manson had been in prison a few years prior. So he was very much a person who took someone's word as their bond. So yeah. when Terry never called, Manson got pretty upset. To this point, Dennis began to see how much Manson and his family were taking advantage of him. And we're to we're to the tune of a hundred thousand dollars, which would be closer to a million dollars today. God. We're talking like buying medis like antibiotics because there was a round of gonorrhea in the family. Like, you know, just having Dennis spend his money. Greg Jacobson recalls hiring a moving company to help get Dennis Wilson out of the home that Manson knew he lived in. It was done quickly and quietly so Manson and his followers wouldn't know. He did what he could to cut ties with Manson and his family. Yeah. So, moving in the middle of the it. night sounds great. Like, oh, this guy's crazy. I need to get the hell out of here. Well, and he was, he was sucking money from him. I like, mean, I don't blame him. I would have done it too. But like... Homie, you're famous. You right. can't it's hide. It's kind of hard to not track you down when you're that well-known. Right. right. So Manson returns to Spawn Ranch with no record deal. Meanwhile, the Beach Boys release a new track called Never Learn Not to Love, which was adapted from one of Manson's songs, Cease to Exist. Now, Manson had previously signed the rights away to the song to the band, according to BBC, in exchange for a single cash payment and a motorcycle. However, some of the lyrics were changed, and that upset Manson the most. So after the song's release in late 1968, Manson sent Wilson a single bullet. Now, I've heard conflicting reports on how he delivered it, but Manson did confirm that he did it. He did so in a 1993 interview with Diane Sawyer, and he says, and I quote, I gave Dennis Wilson a bullet, didn't I? I gave him a bullet because he changed the words to my song. Yeah, but it wasn't your song anymore. You sold it. So technically, you right. have no rights to it anymore. And he's not even credited in, in the song. Like, it's it says it was written by by the Beach Boys. It doesn't say. I mean, they, they changed the lyrics. So Yeah, so technically. You know. Right. Uh, so now we're at a point where Manson, who prides himself on being a leader of people and a good musician, is feeling rejected and upset. So he heads over to Cielo Drive attempting to talk to Terry Melcher and get the promised recording contract out of him. Out of him. Get him another audition, another chance. So when he shows up, Terry's gone. He's fled to Malibu. Yeah. Instead, there's new people living there. Roman Polanski and Sharon Tate. So, obviously at this point, because homie just dipped out in the middle of the night, Manson knows that Melcher isn't at this address anymore. So that's not what happened here. Dennis Wilson just kind of dipped out quickly, right? Because Manson had been basically living there with his family. And then they got the compound and Dennis Wilson was like, and I'm moving. Uh, Terry Melchner knew something was amiss, right? So he basically just announced to to Candace Bergen, he's like, so I'm going to move to Malibu. And she's like, we're moving to Malibu. He's like, no, I'm moving to Malibu. No, 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 no. Not we. I. <laughs> and that's essentially how they broke up. Like, that's a really Cliff Notes version, but... So, Terry Melchner has fled to Malibu. Uh, Candace Bergen had to go find another place to live because she couldn't afford that place by herself. Like, dang, despite, dang. despite all the stuff. So, Manson returns to Cielo Drive expecting to talk to Melchner, finds he's not there anymore, but then now knows that Melchner yeah. isn't there. Obviously. Right. So, 
Chief Prosecutor Vincent Bugliosi believes that the house became more of a symbol to Manchin of the establishment that rejected him. It wasn't so much about who lived there. It was just the symbol that it represented to Manson, which yeah. being of the mindset that he was, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, now, as the summer of 1969 passed, the Manson family began to discuss Helter Skelter more frequently. Charles Manson made an alliance with a motorcycle gang called the Straight Satans to prepare for the upcoming war as an army. He used the girls and the family to attract them, and it stopped being a commune of peace and love. It became more where they were readying for battle. They were training an army. And at this point, Manson starts to break. He starts to instill fear in his family rather than love. But the reason they stayed is they fully believed what Manson was preaching about Helter Skelter and the upcoming war. Manson family member Catherine Scher, again, also known as Gypsy, recalls that the music had stopped and the family knew they needed to find a way to bring in money. So in order to scrape whatever they could, however they could, Manson reverted to his criminal mindset. Gary Hinman was a music teacher in Topanga Canyon that Charles Manson knew because he had previously given drugs to the family. Thinking Gary had money at his house, Bobby Boussoulet and Susan Atkins went out to his home to try and get money from him. Like, you know, you owe us, you owe us. When Gary told them he didn't have any money, Bobby called Manson back at the ranch and relayed what they had been told. So Manson comes out to the house, brandishing his sword. Gary continued to refuse to give Manson and his family any money. So reportedly, Manson begins to cut off pieces of Gary's ear. Manson tells Bobby that he knows what to do with him and to make it look like the Blackies did it. Now, I think I need to interject here and say we do not agree with the, man the language that Manson was known to have used referring to race. However, being a racist, he used terms like this. And we're just telling the story and saying what he said. Obviously, we don't condone the use of these terms. So by now, obviously, there's not a race war on the horizon. And Manson is getting upset because not only was he rejected for a music contract, but the black man isn't doing what he predicted, which is what his followers believe. So if it doesn't happen, what's going to happen to everything he's built, right? So Manson decides to start Helter Skelter himself, showing them how he thinks that they should do it. So after Bobby Boussoulet kills Gary Hinman, he uses Gary's blood to leave a paw print on the wall, trying to say that the Black Panthers did this. And they also wrote political piggy on the wall, referring to the white establishment. At this point, Manson wants to start Helter Skelter by murdering white people and framing black people, mainly the Black Panthers thinking that this would set things in motion. So clearly, they're not super genius crime lords. Bobby Boussoulet stole Gary Hinman's car and was caught driving it with a knife in the car and blood on Bobby's clothes. So he was arrested. Shocker. I know. Uh, I am so shocked. I know. Oh yeah. my God. I am so shocked. Now at this point, he's convinced fo his followers to kill for him. They've killed Gary Hinman. They would probably kill more for him and for the cops. So Manson, in his autobiography, said that one night he privately gave Tex specific instructions. He said, go to this house. He gave him the address, which was 10050 Cielo Drive. And he said, kill everyone there. Make it gruesome. Leave incriminating messages at the scene. Pin the murders on the Black Panthers or other Black militants. Get lots of money. Go to the next house and the next house, and the next one, until this is accomplished. And that is a direct quote from Charles Manson. Said that he said that. Linda Kasabian recalls sitting in the car on the evening of August 8th, 1969. She said she thought that they were waiting to go on a creepy crawly mission, which was breaking into someone's house to steal their jewelry and rearrange the furniture. She says that she remembers Katie and Sadie in the back seat also happy they were picked, because if you were picked to go on a mission for the family... You felt important and special. She recalls before they left, the group took some speed and Charles Manson asked them to leave a sign, something witchy. And if they were going to do something, they needed to do it right. With Tex behind the wheel, they drove off into the night and parked outside the gate of 10050 Cielo Drive just after midnight. Now, what you need to know is that Cielo Drive is a very narrow and very private road. It's almost like an alley. You really just don't drive up and park. There's not really a place to park. So yeah. they parked outside the gate. And Linda recalls when they arrived, there were lights on. Tex got out with rope and wire cutters, and he cut the phone line leading to the house. 
They climbed into the gated area and there was a car coming. Tex went over to the car and just shot the driver four times in rapid succession, killing the drunk. Linda says Tex asked her to get into the car and re retrieve the wallet of the young man he just shot and killed. After doing this, Tex told her around to go around back and he took Patricia Krenwinkle and Susan Atkins with him to the front. Linda went towards the house from the back, passing by the swimming pool, and she says she felt disconnected from the moment. Tex broke in by cutting through a screen and then let Patricia and Susan in through the front door, telling Linda to stay outside and keep watch. Linda says, and I quote, the screams that I heard coming from inside the house were blood curling, chilling screams, screaming for your life. And I couldn't tell if they were male or female. They were just screams. So what happened next is reported in court documents. Tex awoke Fryowski, who was sleeping on the living room couch. Watson kicked him in the head, and Fryowski asked him who he was and what he was doing there. Watson replied, I'm the devil, and I'm here to do the devil's business. Is this some, like, cheesy 80s bully movie? Like, what? It's 1969, so, and they're on speed. My God. So on Tex's direction, Susan and Patricia found Sharon, Jay, and Abigail and forced them into the living room. Tex tied up Sharon Tate and Jay Sebring together by their necks with the rope he had brought and then slung it over one of the living room ceiling beams. Jay Sebring opposed the group's rough treatment of the very pregnant Sharon Tate, so Tex shot him and then proceeded to stab Jay seven times. Talk about overkill. Mm -hmm. Well, Abigail Folger was taken momentarily back to her bedroom for her purse, and she gave the family $70. Voitech's hands had been bound with a towel, but he freed himself and began struggling with Susan Atkins, who stabbed at his legs with a knife. He fought his way out the front door and onto the porch, but Tex pursued him and caught up with him. He suffered a total of 51 stab wounds. He's dead. And, and had been struck on the side of the head 13 times with the butt of a gun, which part of was recovered on the scene. And then he was also shot twice. So you oh want to talk God. overkill, let's talk about that. At roughly the same time Abigail Folger was running across the lawn in an attempt to escape from Patricia, she fled out a bedroom door to the pool area. Patricia chased her, caught her on the front lawn, where she stabbed her and tackled her to the ground. Tex then helped finish her off, and she was stabbed a total, a total of 28 times. Sharon Tate was stabbed 16 times, and she was discovered with rope burns around her neck. Susan Atkins told prosecutors that she told Sharon, Look, bitch, I don't have any mercy on you. You're going to die. There was a moment when Susan said she was thinking of trying to cut the baby out of Sharon's body. Susan used Sharon's blood to write pig on the front door. She claims she did this to copycat the murder scene of Gary Hinman in order to get Manson family member Bobby Boussoulet out of jail. Right, because that that's totally a working idea that they can do. Like Right. Well, and it tells you how thoroughly they were thinking all of this through, right? <clears throat> so now there's some conflicting t testimony because, as I said before, Manson said that he told them to go down from house to house. Linda says that she, as the lookout, was scared and saw some lights on down the road, and she thought about going to another house to ask for help, but then she thought maybe the family would find her, and she was too scared to follow through. She feared for her life and the life of her young daughter, who was still back at the ranch. Yeah. Meanwhile, Susan, in a much later testimony in 1976, concurred with what Manson said in his testimony, was that the plan was for them to go down the narrow street and break into all the homes and do the same thing, which you know, like I said, Manson said in his autobiography. However, Susan's confession was in a televised interview where Susan was trying to change the perspective of the public of her trying to get out of her full life sentence. There's also conflicting testimony of Susan Atkins and Tex Watson. In initial confessions to cellmates at Sybil Brand Institute, Susan said she was responsible for the death of Sharon Tate. In the later statements to her attorney, to prosecutor Vincent Bugliosi, and before a grand jury, Atkins indicated Sharon had been stabbed by Tex Watson. However, in his 1978 autobiography, Tex said that he stabbed Tate and that Susan had never touched her, since he was aware that the prosecutor, Bugliosi, and the jury had tried the other Tate LaBianca defendants. They were convinced that Susan had stabbed Tate. He falsely testified that he did not stab her. So there's all these conflicting testimonies as to who killed her, 
who really did the dirty work and whether or not they were supposed to go down and do the rest of the houses, which they obviously didn't. They just I mean, went. to be fair, like you said, they were high out of their mind when they were doing this. Oh, yeah. So they probably don't really remember who did what, who did when, who killed the bot, who killed the people, just that they all participated in it. Right. Well, now Linda said she went back to the car and waited and everyone came back covered in blood. On the way back to the ranch, Tex instructed Linda to take the bloody clothes and the knives, wipe the prints off the knives and get rid of everything. He told her to roll down the window and throw them out the car and get rid of them. He also says that Patricia was complaining about her hand hurting because it was hard to get the knife through Abigail because her bones were in the way. Uh, yeah. Right. Back at the ranch, they reconnected with Charles Manson, who was up waiting for them. And he asked if they had any remorse. The group told him, no. And Linda remembers trying to remember what the word remorse meant. The next morning, the housekeeper, Winifred Chapman, arrived to Cielo Drive to help get Sharon Tate's home ready for her upcoming baby shower. She discovered the bodies of Jay Sebring, who was an innovative stylist to the stars and close friend of Sharon Tate's, tied with a rope to Sharon Tate. On the lawn, they discovered the bodies of Abigail Folger, who was the heiress to the Folger coffee fortune, and her boyfriend, Wojtek Frayowski, who had all been visiting Sharon Tate's residence that evening. Sharon's husband, Roman Polanski, had been in Europe and was set to come home within a couple of days. Also discovered was Stephen Parent, who was very much, unfortunately, just at the wrong place at the wrong time. He had been on the property visiting his friend, William Gerritsen, who was the caretaker of the property, hoping to sell him some equipment. He was on his way home when he was confronted by Tex and shot in his car. Now, according to Charles Manson, he went to the scene of the crime the night after the fact. In the book, The Manson Family, More to the Story, it says that, and I quote, Charlie knew that some of his orders had not been followed. Followed, The killers didn't get $600. They didn't go to other homes until they got that money. Presumably, he also knew already that not everyone, like Linda, got their hands dirty. He had to know if his most urgent orders were followed. Were the killings gruesome enough? Would the Panthers be implicated? Did the killers leave traceable clues behind? So in Manson, in his own words, as Charles Manson told Newell Emmons in the Grove Press 1986 printing, Manson's quoted as saying, and again, I quote, my only concern was whether it resembled the human, the Hinman killing. Would the police now have reason to believe that Bobby was not the slayer of Hinman? And were the kids loaded with drugs clever enough to leave prints or evidence of their identities? Knowing Sadie and Tex, their flair for dramatic exaggeration, I doubted the slayings went down as they had described. More, most importantly, did they leave a trail that would lead to the ranch? Concern for clues compelled me to get in the Ford and head for Bel Air. I took another mem member of our circle with me. End quote. It's rumored that family member Brenda, or Nancy Pittman, went with him that night. Manson says that he did a sort of drive-by to see if the cops were already there and all was quiet. So they parked at the bottom of the hill and approached on foot, climbing over the fence. He then continues to say, quote, approaching a house where you know there are dead bodies has a spine chilling effect. And I think if I had been alone, I might have forgotten about continuing any further. My partner probably felt the same way, but neither of us spoke. And we did go on to see the whole gory mess. Tex and Sadie's description had been accurate. What I was seeing was not a scene from a movie or some horrible acid fantasy, but real people who would never see the morning sun. I had thoughts of creating a scene more in keeping with a black against white retaliation, but in looking around, I lost the heart to carry out my plans. The two of us took towels and wiped down every place a fingerprint could have been left. Then I placed the towel I was using over the head of the man inside the room. Now, reports of the uh, the crime scene do implicate that there was something over Jay Sebring's head, who was the man in the living room. But it's also said that it was more like a hood. So I don't know. I don't know how true this is. Right. And uh, well, you see, like in crime scene photos, you see something over his head. So right, right, but right, like right. at the end of it, when he's like, you know, I lost the heart to carry out my plans. It almost sounds like he's feeling a little bit of remorse for what he did, for like what he had people do. Sounds like it. It doesn't mean that he did, but yeah, it definitely like it sounds, sounds that like way. It, but then at the same time, it's like, what? Yeah. So in Charles Manson today, the final confessions of a psychopath by Eric Hedegaard, 
in the November 2013 Rolling Stone magazine. Manson is also quoted as saying, again, I quote, I'm lazy. I'll do whatever I can to not do anything. When I do nothing, I survive. I just don't want to take responsibility. The mistake I made is I didn't go with them. Tex was scared. A mama's boy. Oh, they made a mess of it the first night. If I'd been there, it would have been a much better scene. So is he basically... Does that sound like someone this... who has remorse to you? Yeah. So, like, I'm like, is he, is he like, mad because it was more gory than he wanted it to be and it didn't point into the direction of like how he wanted it to go like this was for him trying to start helter skelter like he was on a mission right. to kill as many people as possible like pre preferably like high profile people because yeah. he was feeling rejected by hollywood and the community but like he goes into the house and sees all this like gore and is like acting like he has remorse but then goes on to be like well if i would have gone that night it wouldn't have it would have gone like that like so are you telling me like y you still would have killed them but like right exactly exactly well and i mean there's also reports that sharon tate like begged for you know begged for her life begged for the life of her baby offered to be um just a a, a, a hostage until she could have the baby like yeah you know and that's just ruthless but it, th the whole thing is ruthless period oh yeah um and what's all, what, we'll talk about it in a little bit here, but also Manson was afraid of going back to jail and he was scared that Bobby Boussole was going to pinpoint Manson, which would have sent him right back to prison. Oh, yeah. So he was trying to also say, well, obviously Bobby didn't do this because another one happened and there's clues that link them together mm -hmm. and it's got to be the black man. Like that was his plan. It doesn't mean it was a good plan, but that was his plan. It was a plan. Right. So... He wasn't done, obviously. So on the night of August 10th, 1969, Manson went with a, a, the same people from the night before. And then he added a couple, uh, he added um, a couple of people. So they arrived at 3301 Waverly Drive in Los Angeles. And this was the home of Lino and Rosemary LaBianca. Lino was the owner of a small supermarket chain and his wife owned a busy boutique. Linda describes that night as well. She said that Manson decided to go with them this time because the murders they had done the night before had been too messy and he was going to show them how to do it. Of course, they didn't know he had gone back over to see for himself. So he really knew how messy it was. Yeah. Now, according to Linda's testimony, Manson went up to the house with his sword and broke in, incapacitating the LaBiancas and tying them up. However, police say he probably didn't do this on his own. And Linda says when he returned, he had Tex, Patricia, and Leslie Van Houten return to the house to finish the job. Tex, on the other hand, in his autobiography, claims that Manson went up alone, essentially to check it out, and then returned to take him up to the house with him. Manson pointed out a sleeping man through the window, and he entered. they entered the house through the back door, which was unlocked. Tex claimed that Manson woke a sleeping Lino LaBianca on the couch at gunpoint and had Watson, Tex, bind his hands with a leather thong. Ugh. Rosemary was brought into the living room from the bedroom and Tex covered both of their heads with pillowcases that he bound in place with lamp cords. Now, if you look at crime scene photos or read um, the description, there were lamp cords found next to the body. So this obviously is what happened. So now at this point, Charles Manson leaves and then Patricia and Leslie enter the house. Tex sent the women from the kitchen to the bedroom where Rosemary LaBianca had had gone like they had sent her back there. Yeah. And while he meanwhile, he goes to the living room and begins stabbing Lino LaBianca with a chrome plated bayonet. So the first one went right into his throat. Tex then hears like a skirmish in the bedroom and goes in there to discover Rosemary LaBianca keeping both Patricia and Leslie at bay by swinging the lamp tied to her neck, which I think yeah, is I mean, sense. you got to do what you got to do, man. Right. It says a lot about her, her like desire to survive this. Yeah. Her will to live. Right. So Tex then stabs Rosemary several times with the bayonet and then returns to the living room and resumes stabbing Lino, whom he stabbed a total of 12 times. He then cut the word war into his ab abdomen, although the chief prosecutor of the case says it was Patricia who carved the word. Uh, Tex then returns to the bedroom and finds Patricia stabbing Rosemary with a knife from the kitchen. Leslie stabbed her approximately 16 times in the back and her exposed rear end. 
Leslie Van Houten claimed at trial that Rosemary LaBianca was already dead during the stabbing. And evidence shows that many of the 41 stab wounds that Rosemary LaBianca had, had in fact been inflicted post-mortem. However, Leslie also testified saying, and I do quote, the more I stabbed, the more fun it was, end quote. Tex says he then cleaned off the bayonet and showered while Patricia wrote Rise and Death to Pigs on the walls and Helter Skelter spelled incorrectly on the refrigerator door. She spelled it H-E-A-L-T-E-R instead of H-E-L. She added an A. I mean, um, we can't really be surprised. These guys really aren't that smart. <laughs> uh, well, you know. Well, and also at the same time, they're trying to make it look like, you know, black people did it and they believe them to be subhuman. So there's that too. Um, anyway, she, uh, they used the LaBianca's blood to write the words. And then she gave Lino LaBianca 14 puncture wounds with an ivory handled two tined carving fork, which she then left extending out of his stomach. And she also planted a steak knife in his throat. In the end, Lino had 26 stab wounds total. And before they left, the group also helped themselves to food out of the fridge. Yeah. Okay. That's normal. Right. Well, I mean, they're dead. It's not like they're going to eat it, but still. Yep, still. Now, Linda's testimony says that Manson left them there and drove the other three family members who had departed spawn with him that evening, uh, which was Leslie, Clem Grogan, and Susan Atkins, to the Venice home of the Lebanese actor Saladin Nader. Now, Linda had met this gentleman on the beach recently, and he had told her where he lived. Being an actor, Manson put him as part of the establishment and told Leslie to take the others to his home and kill him too. He dropped them off and Manson left them there and drove himself back to Spawn Ranch, leaving them and the LaBianca killers to hitchhike home. So according to Linda, Manson wanted his followers to murder Nader in his apartment, but she says she didn't want to be responsible for any more death. She claims that she deliberately knocked on the wrong apartment door and woke a stranger instead of the actor. Linda claims she guessed she didn't really know where he lived, so the remaining group abandoned the murder plan and left. But Susan defecated in the stairwell on the way out. Can we just stop and think and like talk about how like that guy probably heard all of this later on in trial? And realize exactly how close he came to ending up like the other victims. Like, could you imagine that? Your I, can't, life I can't. Was I, because- I've had a similar thing happen to some friends of mine. I won't get into it on the podcast, um, but it was, yeah. Uh, and, and I know it messed them up for a while, but. But yeah, like, think about it. Your life was spared because this woman realized, like, oh, I don't want to kill him. Like, I don't know if you're for more death. But what's really interesting about this, though, is even Susan Atkins, who was there, knows that Manson's, you know, his plan was to kill as many people as possible. And even on Cielo Drive, they were supposed to go down and, like, kill all these people. So why didn't they just kill this guy anyway? Maybe because it wasn't. Maybe he, because, because the guy he wasn't that, part of the establishment. Yeah, the guy that answered was wasn't the, part of the establishment. Right. But the point was to kill, right? So why didn't they yeah. kill? I mean, I'm glad they didn't. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But it just, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. So yeah. anyway, um, the LaBiancas were discovered by their 16-year-old son, Frank Struthers. He said wow. he'd been water skiing with friends at Lake Isabella, which is just north of Los Angeles. And he had last seen his mother and stepfather alive the day before when they visited the area and brought back their powerboat. Frank testified that he had planned to return to Los Angeles with his parents, but decided to stay with his friends and come back the next day, which is a decision that I think ultimately saved his life. Yeah. So the next day he arrives home and he says the door was locked and the house was dark. So he called his 23 year old sister, Susan Struthers from a payphone nearby. She arrived a short time later later with her current boyfriend. Frank said that he and the sister's boyfriend, he and his sister's boyfriend found the keys to the house on his mother's key ring which was in her car. They went into the house and found Lino's body in the living room in a type of crouch position. When asked if it appeared La Bianca was injured, he replied, we didn't stay long enough, but that's what it was. And then he said uh, that he and his sister and her former boyfriend went to a neighbor's home and called the police. Rosemary was only 38 and Lino was 44. 
So Linda was tasked later by Charles Manson to go visit Bobby in jail to see if he was okay and to see if he knew what he was going to say to police. Because if he implicated Manson on any level, Manson was going back to prison. Now, Obviously, Manson didn't want that. So on August 13th, Linda took this opportunity to leave under the guise saying that she was going to follow Manson's orders and go visit Bobby. She fled to New Mexico and went into hiding. Now, unfortunately, she ended up having to leave her daughter behind in order to escape, which she hated. But a week after the murder spree, police raided Spawn Ranch in connection with auto theft and illegal weapons. So no one was arrested, but the children were taken into state care and Linda was able to retrieve her daughter by returning to Los Angeles before taking her daughter and going back into hiding. Now, two months after the murders, Susan Atkins was arrested in connection with the murder of Gary Hinman. And as I said before, she, at that time, bragged to her cellmate that she was responsible for the death of Sharon Tate. And she confessed to the cellmate that the family was responsible for both the Tate murders and the LaBianca murders. And that broke the case wide open. So on December 1st of 1969, the LAPD issued arrest warrant arrest warrants for Patricia Krenwinkel, Leslie Van Houten, Tex Watson, Charles Manson, and Linda Kasabian. The trial began on July 15th of 1970, and as the star witness and in exchange for her testimony, Linda Kasabian was given immunity. Manson was convicted because he was the only one who had motive for the murders. The chief prosecutor was able to convict him due to motive and domination over his followers. Patricia Krenwinkel, Leslie Van Houten, Tex Watson, Susan Atkins, and Charles Manson were all convicted of murder and conspiracy to murder. Tex Watson was 21 and sentenced to life in prison. He has been denied parole 18 times since then, including two stipulations. He was most recently given a five-year denial of parole at a board hearing in October of 2021. He remains incarcerated at Richard J. Donovan Correctional Facility in San Diego, California. Susan Atkins was 20 and sentenced to life in prison. She died on September 24th, 2009 at the Central California Women's Facility in Chowchilla. She was 61 and had been suffering from brain cancer. She actually tried to like be like, well, I'm dying. I should be set free. I shouldn't have to die in prison. Blah, 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 blah. She did. She tried. It didn't work. Yeah, the drive. parole board was like, mm, no, go die That's in your cell. Right. You viciously killed a woman who was eight and a half months pregnant? Yeah, yeah. no, I don't think so. Yeah, go die in your cell. Bye-bye. Uh, she did not die alone. Her husband was there, who ironically is also her lawyer. <laughs> was, was her lawyer. Can we just stop for a second and just think about all these people are probably married? Charles Manson was married, I think, what, twice? And he was engaged again by the time he died. But we're going to get into, you know. Um, Now, Patricia Krenwinkel was 21 and sentenced to life in prison. Following the 2009 death of fellow Manson cult member Susan Atkins, Krenwinkel is now the longest incarcerated female inmate in the California penal system. In Krenwinkel's parole hearing on December 29th, 2016, the decision was postponed to investigate the defense claim that Krenwinkel was suffering from battered women's syndrome at the hands of Manson during the time of the murders. The parole hearing resumed on June 22nd, 2017, when the 69-year-old Krenwinkel was denied parole. After her 2017 review, Krenwinkel had been denied parole 14 times. Krenwinkel does remain incarcerated at the California Institution for Women in the Chino District of Corona, California. She will be eligible to have a further parole suitability hearing in May of 2022, this year. So, in a few months. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Leslie Van Houten was 20 and sentenced to life in prison. Van Houten was recommended for parole for the fourth time at a 23rd parole hearing on July 23rd, 2020, and a 120-day legal review period began. On November 28th, Governor Newsom rejected the board's recommendation, again, and vetoed Van Houten's parole. Among his reasons for denial, Newsom stated the then 71-year-old Van Houten, quote, currently possesses an unreasonable danger to society if released from prison, end quote. Again, her lawyer said that they would appeal the governor's latest decision on November 9th of 2021. Van Houten was approved for parole by a parole board, The board's approval is now waiting for Governor Newsom's signature. 
Newsom has denied her parole twice before. Her request for review was rejected by the California Supreme Court on February 9th of 2022. Why would anybody want to parole these people? Like, well, I, I, don't, I don't get it. I, I don't get it. Last but not least, Charles Manson was 33 and sentenced to life in prison. Manson died of a heart attack and complications from colon cancer in 2017 at age 83. Oh, no. So sad. Not really. Linda Kasabian has been in hiding for all these years and continues to be so. When coming out to speak for a documentary called Manson's Night of Horror, The Day We Murdered Sharon Tate by Real Crime, which we will have linked on our website, truecrimeandchill.com, she says, quote, I could never accept the fact that I was not punished for my involvement in this tragedy. I feel then what I feel now, always and forever, that it was a waste it was a waste of life that had no reason, no rhyme. It was wrong, and it hurt a lot of people. Thank you for listening to True Crime and Chill. For more information, including case notes, photos, and sources, please visit our website at truecrimeandchill.com. You can also stay connected with us on social media. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Look for new episodes from us each week on Tuesday.